Hello and welcome to the second part of the camera tracking in Blender series. My name is Hayden Falson from FalsonFantasy.com and let's get to it. In the last episode we looked at creating our camera track and applying it to our 3D scene, so it is only fitting that today we look at how we are able to seamlessly integrate CG elements into live footage. So let's get started. If I was to render this scene now, in either Cycles or Blender internal render engine, it would create the same result. The cube will be rendered and it will cast a shadow. This shadow looks like it's being cast onto the actual wooden floor. So what's going on? The answer to this is compositing. So let's go back to the compositor tree and let's see what's going on. You'll be able to find the compositor in the node editor and within that, within the compositor tab. If you have followed on from last tutorial, your compositor will look something like this, although it may be a bit more messy. I've separated the areas of interest just so it's easier to read. So what is this mess of lines and nodes actually doing? So at the top, we can find our movie clip. So it is being put through all of these nodes and it then is being combined with our background layer. So what is our background layer? Our background layer is a render layer, which can be found on our render layer tab. As you can see, there's background and it's been assigned to render layer 10. But for the sake of this video, I'm going to refer to it as Render Layer 2. All of the objects on Render Layer 2 are automatically assigned to the background render layer. As you can see, the floor plane is the only object if we isolate Render Layer 2. So to simplify things, when we call upon our background render layer in our compositor, it is calling upon the floor plane. And from that, we are extracting data. We're extracting shadow and ambient occlusion data, which we're mixing together to create the shadow values that are then combined with our footage to give the illusion that our box is casting a shadow onto the floor using a multiplication node. Our foreground render layer is set to render layer one. As you can see, the cube is there. And if we just move down, it is this node that is calling upon render layer one. See how the name in this tab and the name in our render layer tab matches? That is how we know it is calling upon that render layer. Now this render layer is being combined with the combination that has already been established with the floor plane and the footy. So then we're able to overlay our cube on top of that. Then it's put into the composite node, which acts as the output node for the compositor and blender. Now let's go over in more detail what exactly render layers are. Render layers are good ways to break up our scene within Blender. This will become all the more important as our scenes become more and more complex. Render layers consist of three integral parts, scene, layer, and mask layer. The scene layers refer to the layers that are going to be included in our final render. So in this case, our final render contains scene one and scene two. This can also be achieved by pressing the render layers down here. The render layers that you have open while rendering will be included in the final composite. Our layer layers are referring to the layers that are included in our render layer, in this case foreground, which is the layer one. So everything on layer one is going to be included in the foreground render layer. As you can see the background, it's render layer two. The mask layer is interesting. It is telling the render layer what other render layer it should mask out. This is especially useful if you've got other objects in your scene that you need to mask out in 3D space. So if I were to click the second render layer on the mask layer, it would treat the background as a mask for the foreground layer. This can be a supremely useful thing to have when compositing together many layers. While I uncheck the second render layer as a mask layer for the first layer, I would like you to keep yours on, as I will be reapplying this later on in the video. Next, we're gonna change our render engine from Blender Internal to Cycles Render, as that is the more popular of the render engines as of this moment. If you would like to use the Blender Internal engine, you do not have to worry about the compositor changing as they both use the same compositor nodes. As of changing to Cycles, when I render the scene now, it's going to look a bit different. This is because the Cycles render engine is an unbiased renderer, unlike Blender Internal, which is a biased renderer. So it calculates things differently, most notably the light. Now you may notice an error in this render. The shadow of the cube is being cut off, and we most certainly do not want this. 
So the reason this is happening is because our floor plane on our second render layer doesn't actually cover that area. So it, the shadow from the cube can't actually be cast onto it because it doesn't exist. So to fix this, all that we have to do is scale this floor plane up to cover the area that we're going to be casting a shadow onto. To get an idea of what's actually going on in our scene within the 3D viewport, I'm going to go and turn on our movie clip by coming here down to background images, adding a new image and selecting movie clip. I am then going to set our movie clip to be in front of our 3D assets and then just decrease the opacity. Now we can see a live rendition of what is happening in our scene within the 3D viewport. Now that we've scaled the full plane up, let's render it again and see the difference that it makes. Now upon rendering, our shadow is cast across the entire floor of our footage, which is great, but we've got another problem now. That problem being that our scene lighting doesn't match the lighting in our actual footage. So we're going to need to fix this in order to create a believable render, as without it, the juxtaposition between the different lighting models is just going to be too much for a lot of the audience, and it's not going to look believable. So if we take a look at this scene, there's a bit of a harsh light coming from around over here. So we want to match this. So in our 3D viewport, we're going to set up our lighting so it's very similar to what's already in our footage. So I'm just going to apply a sun lamp here and rotate it towards my cube. We can go way more in depth into lighting scenes in Blender. However, that is a whole other topic, so we'll go into that in another video. I'm really starting to begin to like where the lighting's heading at the moment, and I feel that it's somewhat matching. Upon playing around a bit more, I've got this, which I think matches the scene. Okay. The next problem is the reflection. As you can see, the floor is actually reflecting the boot. A lot of surfaces in the real world reflect light like this, so we want to be really careful when matching our footage. So to achieve this, I'm going to change the material on the floor plane. I'm going to select my object and then I'm going to go to the materials tab and new material. You can name your material to whatever you feel is appropriate. Upon creating our material, we'll want to have a node editor to edit it. In the node editor, which is where we can find our compositor, we're just going to change it to our shader node editor which is this thing here. So in addition to the diffuse node that's already here, I probably want a glossy shader. So I'm just going to grab a glossy BSDF shader, and then I want to grab a mix shader and plug the first diffuse node into the input node of the mix shader, and then input the glossy node into the second socket of the mix shader. I then want to play around with the roughness value of the glossy shader just until I match the reflection of the source footage. Now I think that looks pretty good. If we render this out now, we're not going to get our glossy surface on our floor, as we can see here. The reason for this is because we haven't actually composited into our final composite. So if we go back to our compositor and we go to our background render layer, we'll see that we can't actually do much with it right now because there isn't actually the information output for our glossy values. So what we want to do is we want to go to our render layers, select our background layer and go down to the passes tab where we want to select indirect glossy channel. This will give us the output of our indirect glossy channel upon rendering in the compositor, which we can then use to composite the glossiness into our final shot. After our image is rendered, I'm just going to split the window and make it my compositor window so I can see the output while I'm editing. I'm also going to delete my viewer node from the end of the composite and then turn on backdrop and then put my viewer node back into the composite but at an earlier state. This will allow me to isolate elements and see how they're being edited or affected by different nodes that I'm going to plug them into. See how when I plug the glossy indirect channel into the viewer node, it shows up in the backdrop of mind compositor window? In this way, we can take elements of our composite and isolate them, and then we can then see how our edits affect them without affecting our final composite. So what we want to do first is we want to create a mix node and then we're going to drag our glossy values into the second socket of our mix node. 
Now, as you can see, this isn't what we really want as it's drowning out a lot of the colors. So we're going to have to mask this. So we're going to drag our glossy value into our factor of our mix node. This fixes the problem of our glossy value drowning out all of our composite. But now we're not getting that reflection in our floor. So we're going to add in a color ramp node and apply it to the wire that is affecting our factor of our mix shader. We're then going to crunch the white value down. And as you can see, we're starting to get that reflection back into our composite. Now this may not be a perfect solution, but it does do the trick. Now that the basics of our composite is set up, we can now move on to more advanced compositing techniques where we're going to interact with objects in our scene, such as the boot. But that is going to have to wait until the next part of this tutorial. By the end of this tutorial series, you'll have a strong understanding on how to recreate a scene such as this in Blender. If you've enjoyed this video and learned something, give this a like. And if you'd like to see more, please consider subscribing. Thank you very much. This is Hayden Falson from FalsonFantasy.com, signing off.